noticed that we're under construction? Kind of noticed that along the way? You've seen our uh, new man traps. I was, I was hoping when I heard the word man traps, our single ladies would be really excited. But they're only to keep the noise down. So uh, they, are, they are temporarily installed. They'll be doing some more work this week, floating, taping, painting, all the, all the stuff that I've learned a little bit about through this entire process that I'm not so sure I ever want to do again. But uh, we are excited to see the, the foyer uh, being renovated and to help um, us effectively keep the noise in the foyer because I can't wait for you guys to see how big our new foyer is going to be. So we're going to have a lot of place to fellowship, a lot of place to, to visit, but also it'll be allow us to keep the noise in here as well so it doesn't disturb, doesn't disturb our Sabbath school classes and other things that are happening during the time that we're in the sanctuary. So let me give you a little bit of a timeline. One of the questions I get asked the most is, Pastor Tom, when is it going to be done? And I say yes. Because I've discovered with construction, there is no solid answer. The answer they tell you today is a little different than the answer they tell you tomorrow. So here's what I'm going to say today, the last day of September, what the plan is. The plan right now is the end of October for that wall that you see in the south side to be completely gone. The bathrooms will be um, completely renovated. The fellowship hall will be expanded. We're going to have two larger classrooms down there that are going to be separated by movable walls so that we can open up the entire south wing for our fellowship hall. They're telling us we can seat over 300 people in there. I'm not so sure in talking to our events coordinator. We're going to have to see how that all works out. But it's going to be significantly larger than we're able to right now. So that is the end of October. The wall that you see at the, where the foyer is... That will be demolished the end of November when the project is pretty much done. You'll be able to access the foyer. We'll have a new main entrance. So that is the end of November. They're saying about Thanksgiving time. Then on December 9th, and you have in your hands a VIP invitation to our grand opening on December 9th at 3 o'clock where we officially open the Gail Tucker Youth Annex. We are going to have an amazing worship service, worship services that morning. We're going to have a lunch in our newly renovated fellowship hall for all of us. And then at 3 o'clock, we're going to gather together and we are going to celebrate. Or as I told the first and second grade class who I took out to the building today, we're going to party that day. Because this is a new chapter in the history of the Arlington Church where we get to expand our space where our children and our youth can be discipled in Jesus Christ. So December 9th, you are going to want to be here. I've already talked to the union president. He will be here. Our conference president will be here. I'm hoping, I've sent an invitation to our North American Division president. We'll see if he can fit it into it, to his schedule, a representative from the North American Division. We're hoping to have some representatives from Tarrant County, from the city of Arlington. But most importantly, I'm hoping you'll be here because this is our building. You've been very generous in helping us move the ball forward to get it, to, to get it almost to completion and uh, so we're excited that in a few short months, the Gail Tucker Youth Annex will be open for our kids and our youth to be able to have a larger space for them to not only learn about Jesus, but more importantly, for them to invite their friends to come to learn about Jesus. So please, please, please mark it on your calendar, December 9th, 3 o'clock, following the, the ceremony and the ribbon cutting. We're going to take you on a tour of the building. We're going to have our Sabbath school classes out there, or our Sabbath school teachers out there, showing you the amazing place where your kids and my kids are going to learn about Jesus. So it's a few short months away. Thank you for putting up with all the construction dust and all the, all the coming in the other way. But I'm telling you, it will be amazing when it's all said and done, and it will be done for the expansion of the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have as a community of believers to come together, to fellowship, to worship, to praise your name. Lord, we've done it through our singing. We've done it through our giving. We've done it through 
going before your throne boldly just as you asked us to. And now, Father, I pray in these few moments that we spend opening your word, looking at a familiar story, but literally a life-changing story, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be here in a mighty way. And Lord, we thank you for the great privilege we have to call you our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. They had seen much in their short time with him. They saw massive crowds shadowing his every move and watched as they leaned in to catch every word that came from his mouth. They saw the children clamoring to sit on his lap and then watched as Jesus opened his arms so they could sit on his lap and be close to their friend Jesus. They saw Jesus touch the untouchable and they watched as the healed looked at their skin now without a trace of leprosy. They saw him touch the eyes of those who could not see and then watched as those who now had their sight restored gazed at the creation around them. They saw him touch the legs of those who could not walk and then watched as those who could now use their legs leap for joy. They saw him touch a lifeless body and then watched as his son was reunited with his mother. They saw him take five loaves and two fish and then watched a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children eat until they were full. They saw one of their own take a priceless jar of perfume and pour it over the feet of Jesus and then watched the faces of those witnessing this event be told that her story would be retold many, many times. They saw his closest friends clamor for the seat of honor in that upper room and then watched as the one that would soon betray him sat in that place. But nothing the women saw over the three and a half years that they ministered to and took care of Jesus and his disciples prepared them for what would happen that fateful weekend. They were each awakened with the news that their beloved Jesus had been not only arrested, but had been sentenced to die that very day on a rough wooden cross. Without consulting with each other, they made their way outside of the city to that jagged outcropping of stone where the execution was to take place. As they approached, they saw soldiers drive nails into the hands of the one who had touched so many, into the feet of the one who had walked so many miles to minister to others, and then watched as the cross containing the body of Jesus was raised heavenward in that early morning sun. As they stood at the foot of the cross, they saw on either side of their innocent master common theme thieves and then watched as these thieves took turns taunting their beloved Jesus crucified between them. They saw the agony on the face of Jesus and then watched as every muscle in his body tensed up as he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They saw the noonday sun hidden from their view and then watched as the cross of Jesus seemed to be enshrouded in a deathly darkness. They saw the ground heave as an earthquake shook the ground and then watched as those who had just hours before had yelled, crucify him, crucify him, ran away in fear. 
They saw the chest of Jesus drawing shallower breaths and then watched as with one last gasp cry out, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. They saw the Son of God rest his head on his chest and watched as he took his last breath and died. They saw the soldiers come by who were amazed that he was already dead and then watched as these rough warriors took the body of Jesus off the cross. They saw Joseph and Nicodemus approaching with tools to prepare the corpse for burial and watched as they gently wrapped the body of Jesus in a beautiful white cloth. They saw these two secret followers of Jesus take the body to Joseph's tomb and then watched as they took it inside and laid it on a cold, hard slab. They saw other men approach the tomb and then watched as a large stone rolled over the mouth of the sepulcher. Yes, they had seen much over the course of the last three years, but never in a million years would they have imagined that they would ever see what they witnessed that weekend. They saw the men who rolled the stone in front of the tomb take their leave of Joseph and Nicodemus and then watch as they returned to the city to celebrate this very holy Passover Sabbath. And though these two women wanted to stay and just gaze at the burial place of Jesus to help and try to make sense of what they had witnessed the last 12 hours, they too took their leave returning to their homes to suffer through what was going to be an agonizing Sabbath, but promised each other that they would be back after the Sabbath was over and after it began to get light so they could do their part in preparing the body of Jesus for permanent entombment. But we know the story doesn't end there. Matthew tells us what happens next. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn in the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. They kept their promise. They kept their promise to each other. And just as the eastern sky was beginning to shine, signaling the beginning of the the dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary began the journey through the silent streets of Jerusalem out the western gate toward the place where Jesus was buried. As the three crosses came again into view, they were reminded that what they had seen the last 48 hours was not a bad dream or a nightmare, but instead it was reality. Just as they were about to reach the tomb, 
They saw and felt again the ground heave underneath them as another earthquake occurred. As the ground stopped shaking, they continued the few paces to the place where on Friday afternoon they had seen the body of Jesus buried. As they arrived, they saw two things that immediately disturbed them. First, they saw what seemed to be soldiers' bodies strewn all around the tomb. Soldiers. What were they doing here, they thought to themselves. And who or what killed them? But soon that shocking scene became almost an afterthought as they looked at the tomb itself. They immediately saw that the large stone that had sealed the entrance to the tomb was no longer there. The entrance to the tomb was wide open. And as their gaze moved to where the stone now lay, they were astonished by what they saw. There sitting on the stone that had once blocked the entrance to the tomb of Jesus was a man dressed in white robes. Immediately, their hearts began to beat faster. The adrenaline began coursing through their veins and their minds began to race and wonder if they should run or if they should stay. But before they could make the decision, the man sitting on the stone spoke to the Marys. He said to them, you must be looking for Jesus, the man from Nazareth, the one who was crucified on that cross over there, but you're looking in the wrong place. You are looking in a cemetery for someone who is alive. He isn't here. He has been raised from the dead. He is alive. And then the angel, then the angel gives Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James an invitation they couldn't resist. He said, if you don't believe me, come and see yourself. You were here just a few short days ago and you saw them place his body into the tomb. Come and see that the slab that once held his body is now empty. Can you imagine what it must have been like for the two Marys to tentatively walk up to the entrance to the tomb? to very gingerly and very carefully look inside to the place where just a few short days before held the body of their beloved Jesus. And as they looked, they saw that there was nothing in the tomb. The tomb was empty. Jesus wasn't there. He was alive. Now, I must admit that I think for the two Marys, it must have been hard to believe at first, don't you think? I mean, a tomb that just a few days earlier had been occupied now was empty. You see, tombs don't do that. Tombs don't give up their occupants. Now, I've been to many tombs to places where people are buried. And I've seen some burial places of some important people. I visited the tomb of Abraham, the patriarch in Hebron. I have seen the sarcophagus of Abraham with the words written, Abraham, father of many nations. And I asked the tour guide there in Hebron, I said, is Abraham really buried there? And the tour guide smiled and said, yes, he is buried underneath that beautiful sarcophagus. 
I visited the tomb of Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois. I've seen the headstone upon which is written Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, and I asked the tour guide if Abraham Lincoln really was buried there. And the tour guide smiled and said, yes, Abraham Lincoln's body lies underneath that marble headstone. I visited the tomb of John F. Kennedy in Arlington, Virginia. And I've seen the tombstone upon which is engraved John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 1917 to 1963. And I asked the tour guide next to the grave, is JFK really buried there? And the tour guide said, yes, the body of John Fitzgerald Kennedy lies underneath that marble headstone. And I, like the women, have visited the tomb of Jesus. I saw the place where his body was laid, but on this tomb there is a very different inscription. It doesn't say Jesus of Nazareth 4 BC to 31 AD. Instead, the inscription reads, he is not here, he is alive. And when I asked the tour guide, I said, is it really true that Jesus isn't in that tomb? He smiled and said, no, Jesus isn't dead. He is alive. Come and see the empty tomb. And so I, like the two women, walked into the place that once held the body of Jesus, and I saw it was indeed empty. And I discovered what those two women discovered almost two millennia ago. Jesus is not there. He is risen, and he is alive. These two women who had seen so much over the course of their relationship with Jesus, now saw the one thing they would never forget. They saw a tomb that once held the body of Jesus, which was now empty because he was alive. But I want you to notice that the angel doesn't finish with the invitation to come and see. Notice what else he says to the women. He says, then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. The angel says to the women, now you've seen, now you've experienced, now you are go to go and tell others what you experienced and saw today. Tell them that the tomb is empty. Tell them that Jesus is alive. Tell them that he is risen. Go. Tell his friends. Go tell his followers what you have seen and what you have experienced. And the principle is the same 2,000 years later. You see, when you experience the fact that the tomb of Jesus is empty, when you experience the fact that the one who died on Friday and was raised from the dead on Sunday is now alive, you cannot keep that fact to yourself. You have to tell everyone you meet that he is alive. You see, the call to come and see is also a call to go and tell. You cannot truly experience the empty tomb of Jesus and not be excited and ecstatic to tell everyone you meet that the Son of God is alive. I can still remember Almost 18 years later, 
after firsthand seeing that the tomb of Jesus was empty, walking out of the church of the Holy Sepulchre and wanting to pull people aside and say, he's not in there. His body isn't in there. He is alive. He is risen. Because think about this for a minute. I had seen the tomb of Abraham, father of the Jews, and that tomb held the body of Abraham. You can go to Saudi Arabia and visit and see the tomb of Muhammad. That tomb isn't empty. The body of Muhammad is still there. You can go to China and you can see the tomb of Confucius and that tomb, that tomb isn't empty either. Confucius' body still lays there. You can go to India and you can see the remains of Buddha. Buddha is dead. But Jesus, Jesus is alive. Abraham, Muhammad, Confucius, Buddha, they are all dead. But Jesus, he is alive. His tomb is empty. But I love the fact that the story doesn't end there. I mean, if you thought that seeing the empty tomb was amazing. These women hadn't seen anything yet. Notice what it says in verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, what happened? Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. As the women were rushing away from the tomb, still trying to make sense of what they had seen, ready to tell the disciples what they had experienced, something else amazing happened. There, standing in their path, was the risen Savior himself. If you think they were astonished by the empty tomb, they were flabbergasted as they gazed upon the one whom they had seen crucified only days before. He was now standing before them, alive. They fell on their faces. They worshiped him. But notice what Jesus tells them. Don't keep this experience of the empty tomb or of seeing me to yourselves. I want you to go and tell others that they too will be able to see me and experience my presence. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Three times, three times in Matthew chapter 28, the command to go tell others about Jesus is given. Have you noticed that? The angel tells them to go, Jesus tells them to go, and then at the end of chapter 28, Jesus tells all of his followers to go, to tell people about the risen Lord. But what's interesting is you look at the context, the invitation to go is only given after the invitation to experience the risen Lord. Belief, belief always turns into becoming a blessing to others. Christianity is not based on blind faith. Christianity is found on experiencing Jesus firsthand, believing in him, but that belief never stops here. It always leads to here because I want to tell others about Jesus. He's alive and soon coming back to take us home. And I'm convinced that if that famous hymn would have been written at the time of the two Marys, 
who saw that empty tomb and that risen Lord, they would have gone down the path into the streets of Jerusalem singing at the top of their lung, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Today, the invitation goes forth just as it did two millennia ago to come, to see, to experience the risen Lord. See what he can do in your life. And once you come, once you see who Jesus is and what he has done for each one of us, we are then invited to go and tell. To tell the world that I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Today I know he's living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. Why? He lives. He lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives salvation to impart. And you ask him, you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. See the empty tomb. Experience the risen Jesus and then go be a blessing to others.